The Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe. One dull, dark day in autumn, I was traveling on horseback through a dreary stretch of countryside. At nightfall, I came in sight of the House of Usher. This was the home of Roderick Usher, who had been my childhood friend. It had been many years since he and I had seen each other. I lived at the time in a distant part of the country. However, he had recently written me a long letter telling me of a serious illness and of a mental disturbance that had taken hold of him. He said he had to see me as his best, oldest, and only friend. He hoped that his health would improve with my cheerful company. The only answer I could possibly give was to go at once to his home. Roderick Usher had always been a quiet person who talked little of himself, so I didn't know too much about him. Yet I did know that his family was an old one. Many of his ancestors had been famous for their artistic and musical abilities. Others were known for their exceptional generosity and charity. In the part of the country where he lived, the House of Usher had come to mean both the family and its ancestral mansion. Now, on this dark autumn evening, I was approaching the House of Usher. It was a melancholy-looking building, and I looked on it with an icy sinking of the heart. The walls were gray and bleak, covered only by a string-like web of moss and other clinging plants. I looked at the vacant, eye-like windows, and at the few white bare trunks of decaying trees that still stood in the damp, swampy ground surrounding the old house. As I looked at the house, it seemed to me that it was being wrapped in a strange, vaporous cloud. A mystic fog seemed to rise from the decaying trees and nearby swamp until it covered the gray stone walls. Yet the walls stood upright and perfect. Only a few stones were crumbling. A closer look, however, disclosed the tiniest sliver of a crack zigzagging its way down from the roof. The crack went right down to the wall's foundation, ending under the damp, swampy earth. Noticing these things, I went up the short road to the house. A servant met me and took my horse, and I entered an arched hallway. Another servant led me to my friend. We walked, silently, through many dark and winding passages. I noticed carved ceilings, gloomy tapestries on the walls, and black wooden floors. On a staircase I met the family physician, who introduced himself to me. He hesitated strangely, looking somewhat evil, while at the same time frightened, then continued on his way. At last the servant threw open a door, and I saw my friend resting in a chair. Roderick Usher rose to greet me with great warmth. We were in a huge room. The ceiling was high over my head. The windows, long and narrow and pointed, were so high they could be reached only by ladder. Dark draperies covered the walls. The furniture was antique, but tattered and uninteresting. Many books and musical instruments lay scattered about the room, but they gave it no warmth or feeling of life. I seemed to be breathing an atmosphere of great sorrow. Surely no man had ever changed so greatly in a few years as had Roderick Usher. He had always been thin, with a pale, narrow face and large eyes, but now his face was ghostly, his eyes too bright. His silken hair had grown and had not been trimmed, so it now floated wildly about his face, making it look even thinner. He began to talk about his illness. He said it ran in his family, a nervous ailment with many strange and contradictory symptoms, but no cure. His body was so extremely sensitive that only the softest clothing could touch his skin. Only the blandest food could tempt him, and only the faintest light could glow without injuring his eyes. He could not bear the odor of any flower, and he was filled with horror by all sounds except 
the gentlest music played by stringed instruments. He was also plagued by strange terrors. I dread the future, he said. I shudder at the thought of any coming event. I feel that I will lose my life and reason together in some uncanny struggle with a grim fantasy. I know that fantasy to be fear. He talked on, telling me also some superstitions about his mansion that filled him with terror. He could not describe them other than to say that the gloomy forms of the walls and turrets and swamps seemed to be affecting his spirit. Yet, for some unexplained reason, he had not been able to bring himself to leave his ancestral home for many years. Then he went on to explain that his gloomy spirit was further burdened by the severe and incurable illness of his beloved sister, Madeline. She was his sole companion and his last and only relative on earth. Her death, he said bitterly, would leave me the last of the ancient family of the ushers. While he spoke, Madeline entered through one door at the far end of the room and disappeared through another, without even noticing my presence. I stared at her in astonishment and dread, though I knew not why. When I turned back to her brother, I saw his face buried in his hands and passionate tears trickling through his emaciated fingers. Madeline's illness, he informed me, quite puzzled her physicians. She had lost interest in everything. She was wasting away to a shadow, and for long periods of time she would sit or stand quite still, unmoving for hours. Later that evening, my friend sadly informed me that Madeline had been bedridden with exhaustion and with the deterioration and emaciation caused by her disease. Therefore, the glimpse I had gotten of her would probably be the last I would get, at least while she was living. After telling me these things, Roderick Usher talked no more of his sister. In the next few days, I tried earnestly to cheer my friend, we read together, or I listened to his wild strumming on the guitar, his fingers causing it to speak in an unearthly voice. Usher had also inherited the artistic talents of his ancestors. I watched as he painted. He worked feverishly, painting several canvases in succession. One of his paintings in particular stays in my mind. It was a small picture, showing only the inside of a very long rectangular tunnel with low walls, smooth and white. The design showed this tunnel to be far below the surface of the earth. There was no window, no opening, no torch to produce any source of light, yet the scene seemed as bright as though it were lit by the rays of a splendid hidden sun. <laughs> How strange! We talked during those days of many things, Usher confided to me an idea he had, an idea that things, even plants and stones, had knowledge and a purpose for being, just as animal and human life has. <laughs> I was sure these ideas were proof of his disordered mind, until I heard his next statement. The proof, dear friend, the proof of what I have said is this. You have seen the swamp that surrounds the walls? There is a cloud, an atmosphere, rising from this swamp, swirling about the house. It, it enfolds the walls, pressing in upon them. I looked up with a start, for this was the very thought that had overcome me when I approached the old mansion. Roderick continued, this, this atmosphere rises from the swamp to press on me. Thus it influences, it shapes, and molds me and my life, just as it has molded the destinies of my family through the ages. I heard these words with a shudder, and I was glad when my friend got off this subject and turned again to his books. So the days passed. 
One evening, my friend informed me that his sister Madeline was no more. Oh, my dear friend, I, I am terribly sorry to hear this, I began. But he interrupted my condolences as though he had not heard. I, I intend, he said, to preserve her body for two weeks before burial. The physicians have been too curious about her strange illness, and they might wish to make further examinations. I, I fear they might get to her body if we put her into her grave now, but if we wait a while, they will not know when or, or where we will bury her. And where do you plan to do that, my friend? I asked. Well, the family burial grounds are quite far away, but there are compartments within the thick stone walls of this house. Uh, his voice trailed off, and he was lost in thought. Huh. An unusual decision, I thought, but if that evil-looking physician I passed on my arrival was one who might disturb Madeline's rest, well, then Roderick's precaution was wise. When Madeline's body had been placed in a coffin, Usher and I alone carried it to its temporary tomb. This was a vault, or compartment, in the foundation walls of the mansion. It was small, damp, and without any light. It was directly under the room in which I was staying. In ancient times, it had served as a dungeon. Centuries later, it was used to store gunpowder, in the walls, floor, and even the heavy iron door were covered with sheets of copper to keep out the dampness. I noticed particularly the sharp, grating sound made by this door as it moved slowly upon its hinges. We placed our mournful burden upon wooden stands inside this vault. The coffin lid was not yet fastened, and we opened it to look once more on the face of Madeline Usher. For the first time, I noticed the striking resemblance between the brother and sister. My friend, perhaps guessing my thoughts, murmured something about their having been twins. He said that strange understandings had always existed between them, secret understandings, unknown to anyone else. But we couldn't bear to look upon her for long. Her illness had left a faint redness on her face and a suspiciously lingering smile on her lips, a smile which is terrible in death. We replaced the coffin lid and screwed it down. Then we left the vault, fastening the iron door behind us, and went upstairs into the upper portion of the house. This was almost as gloomy as the vault we had just left. As the days passed, a change came over my grieving friend. No more did he play his guitar, paint, or even read. Instead, he roamed constantly from room to room with hurried but purposeless steps. His face became, if possible, even more pale and ghastly. His once bright eyes became dull. He spoke with a nervous tremor which seemed to come from some unknown terror. There were times I thought he struggled for the courage to confide to me a terrible secret. Then the moment would pass. At other times I became convinced it was his madness, for he stared into space for hours. He seemed to be listening to some imaginary sound. His condition terrified me, and, and then it infected me. I felt myself coming under the spell of the nameless terrors and the superstitions that so profoundly affected him. This feeling it grew upon me gradually. It reached its full power about a week after we had placed the Lady Madeline in the dungeon. It was a stormy night. I could not sleep. I, I lay awake in the dark as the dark hours passed. I, I tried to use my reason to get rid of the nervousness that came over me. I, I tried to tell myself that the gloomy furniture of my room and, and the dark draperies, they must be the cause of the oppressive feeling that lay upon me. But the terror would not leave me. Instead, it seemed to settle on me more heavily. I tried again to rid myself of its weight. I sat up in bed and listened to the sounds of the night. Through the storm I heard strange, low, faint sounds. Then they ceased. 
only to begin again after a few minutes. I was overcome by a strong sense of horror. I, I knew I would sleep no more that night, so I rose and hastily dressed. I tried now to get rid of the dread feelings by pacing the floor. I had taken only a few turns in this manner when I heard a step in the corridor. In an instant, Usher was rapping at my door. He stared about the room silently for some minutes. Then he spoke. Y you have not seen it? he asked. Y you have not, but you shall. With that, he hurried to a window and opened it to the storm. A furious gust of wind entered and nearly lifted us from our feet. It was a tempestuous yet strangely beautiful night. Clouds hung thickly about the turreted roof of the house. The wind blew in violent gusts, pausing now and again. The clouds were tossed about, coming together, and then being blown apart before our eyes. The lower surfaces of the moving clouds and the tree trunks all about the house were bathed in an eerie glow. Yet no moon shone, no stars twinkled, no lightning flashed. What then was this strange, unnatural light that seemed to be circling about the old mansion? You, you must not, you must not watch this, I said with a shudder to Usher. I led him firmly away from the window to a chair. These wild visions, they, they are simply electrical phenomena from the storm, or, or perhaps they rise from the swamp. I'll close the window. <laughs> the air is too chilly, too damp for you. I did so, and he did not protest. Now, I said, picking up the nearest book, I will read to you, and, and so we'll pass this stormy night. The story was an old adventure tale. The hero, Ethelred, set out to do battle with an evil hermit. I read. Arriving at the hermit's door, Ethelred lifted his sword and struck several blows in the wooden planks, cracking and ripping them apart. As I finished that sentence, my breath suddenly caught in my throat. I paused. It seemed to me, or was it my imagination, that from some remote part of the house came an exact sound like the one I had just described, a cracking and ripping of wood. Probably the storm, I thought, and returned to the, to the story. <clears throat> Inside the house there was no sign of the hermit, Instead, Ethelred saw before him a scaly dragon with a tongue of fire. The dragon was sitting guard before a palace of gold, with a floor made of silver. And Ethelred uplifted his sword and struck off the head of the dragon. As it fell, the beast gave forth a horrible and piercing shriek. At these words, there came to my ears a low and distant cry. It was a screaming or grating sound very like the dragon's shriek of which I had just read. But this cry was not my imagination. I did hear it. The nameless terror I had felt in my sleepless bed earlier in the evening came over me again. But I was concerned for the nervous state of my friend, and I tried not to excite him. Perhaps he had not heard the distance cry. Perhaps I had imagined it. But... A strange change had come over him. We had been sitting facing each other, but now he turned his chair away from me and faced it toward the door. His lips were trembling. His head was dropped on his chest, and his eyes were open wide. In this position, he began swaying from side to side. To take his attention away from whatever he might have heard, I began hastily to read again. And now Ethelred pulled the dragon's body out of the way. Bravely he approached the castle, walking on the silver pavement. Over the castle doorway hung an enchanted shield of brass, the prize for anyone brave enough to kill the dragon. As Ethelred approached, the shield fell down at his feet upon the silver floor, with a mighty, great, and terrible ringing sound. No sooner had these words passed my lips than I became aware of another sound. It was a distant, hollow, metallic sound. Completely unnerved, I leaped to my feet, but Usher seemed undisturbed. 
he was still swaying gently from side to side, his eyes staring at nothing. I rushed to him and placed my hand on his shoulder to soothe him. A shudder came over his entire body, and he began to speak in a low, hurried murmur, unaware that I was even there. Not hear it? Yes, I hear it, and have heard it, he said through quivering lips. Long, 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 many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it. Yet I dared not. Oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am. I dared not speak. We have put her living in the tomb. I told you how sensitive I have become in my illness. Many days ago, I heard her first feeble movements in the coffin, yet I dared not speak. And now, tonight, Ethelred, the breaking of the hermit's door, the death cry of the dragon, the clanging of the brass shield as it fell, what they really were were the breaking of her coffin lid, the grating of the iron door of her prison, and her struggling to get out of the copper vault. Oh, where can I fly? She will be here soon to punish me for burying her before she was dead. Even now, I hear her footstep on the stair. Even now I hear the horrible beating of her heart. At this he sprang furiously to his feet. Madman, he shrieked. Madman, I tell you that now she stands outside this door. At his last words, the huge antique door opened slowly. From what? From a rushing gust of wind? And there... Standing in the doorway was the shrouded figure of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white robes, and the evidence of a bitter struggle was upon every inch of her body. For a moment she stood trembling in the doorway. Then with a low, moaning cry, she flew to her brother and threw herself violently upon him. With a cry of final death agony, she dragged him with her to the floor, a corpse. Roderick Usher was dead a victim of the terrors he himself had foreseen. In my own terror, I fled from that room and from that mansion. The storm was still raging as I found myself out on the road. Suddenly, a wild light flashed across the path in front of me. I turned to see where it came from, for behind me were only the vast house and its shadows. Then I saw where the strange light was coming from. It was the blood-red light of a full setting moon, it glowed through a crack in the wall of the house, the same zigzag crack I had noticed on my arrival, the crack that zigzagged its way down from the roof to end in the damp, swampy earth. While I gazed, this crack rapidly widened. Suddenly, a fierce gust of wind, a whirlwind, burst upon the house. My brain reeled as I saw the once mighty walls come crashing down. I heard a tumultuous shouting like the roaring voice of a thousand oceans. I stood there frozen, gazing in awe as the tumbling walls began to sink. Then the deep swamp at my feet closed angrily and silently over the fragments of the House of Usher. <laughs>